Welcome to the Wakefield College Question Time event. It's the second of these. We had one five years ago. Uh, that was terrifying for me, and this one's equally terrifying. So please uh, bear with me through this. Uh, we have five candidates today. Last time we had four representing uh, major UK parties now. And uh, the Green Party and UKIP are both putting forward more than 500 and 600 candidates this time around, which is incredible. So we've got five parties in the UK now. Uh, it's a fairly simple format. We've uh, got three weeks to the election and we kind of need to find out what these parties believe in. So it's a very simple format. We're first of all going to hear from Sam for a minute or two. Uh, each candidate then gets four minutes to put forward the case of their party. And then we've got a series of ten set questions for which each candidate will get a minute's response. It's not going to be the kind of bickering thing that you see on Question Time on TV if you came for that or any fighting or anything like that, okay? It's going to be uh, the party's positions on different policies, education, health, and things like that. Uh, so we're going to start over with uh, Sam. Thank you, David. I'd just like to take the opportunity to say a really warm welcome and a huge thank you for coming along to Question Time this morning. <laughs> so welcome to staff, governors, of course our students, and for local school students too who've been able to join us this morning. I'd like to say thank you to David who's going to host this event for us this morning. I think it's quite an important event because I think we all know that democracy and voting are two important strands of our society. And an event like this really is vital in increasing awareness around the importance of voting, particularly for young people. So I'd like to thank um, the candidates from the five main political parties for taking part and agreeing to the debate. So a warm welcome to Mary at the end there, Mary Craig, who's representing Labour. We've then got Rebecca Thackeray from the Green Party, Anthony Calvert from the Conservative Party, Rebecca Taylor from Lib Debs, and finally Alan Hazelhurst from UK. So a really warm welcome and I, I think amongst with others, are really looking forward to finding out how each party really does plan to help the people of Wakefield. So with no further ado, back to David who will start the debate for us. Thanks Thank so you. Much, Sam. Uh, we're going to start with Mary first to come up and give her a four minute presentation. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Thanks very much indeed, David. The choice facing you at the next uh, election is a choice between a failing plan under the Conservatives or a better plan for you and your generation with the Labour Party. I'm a proud member of the Labour Party and I have been since I was 20 because we're the party of social justice, the party of aspiration and the party that believes that no matter what your background, everybody should have the chance to get on in life. We believe that by our common endeavour we achieve more together than we do by acting alone. So we're an outward looking internationalist party helping Britain make its way in the world. And we're also a, the first mainstream Green Party in the socialist tradition with our Climate Change Act in 2008 that Ed Miliband brought in. As your MP for the last um, 10 years, I've worked very hard for this city. Um, we, we got uh, 13 million pounds in to protect the city from devastating weather events, the devastating floods that hit us in 2007. I brought people together to uh, get together a four and a half million pound project to upgrade the Kergate station. That's going to act as a catalyst for regenerating the whole of that part of Wakefield. And we've got a new hospital and two new schools uh, into the city. Now, as a member of the Shadow Cabinet, I'm responsible for international development, but before that, I was responsible for environment, food and rural affairs. So we stopped the Conservatives from selling off England's forests. And I also passed as a backbencher the Children's Food Bill, which um, upgraded nutritional standards of school meals, although I'm sure you want to have a word with me outside and say that your school dinners are perhaps not as good as they should be. I also passed a law to tackle um, a loophole that meant that people who committed genocide and mass murder in different countries could escape justice in this country. That's a loophole I'm very proud to have tightened. I want to talk about what's happened with the last five years of this Tory Lib Dem government. Britain's families are going backwards, so the recovery has not reached into the homes here in Wakefield. Working people, £1,800 a year worse off. 
tuition fees trebled, the number of apprenticeships for young people under 25s going down. And um, we know that our NHS and our public services are in crisis, um, with over a million people waiting over four hours in A&E last year and waiting lists to see a GP going up. Labour has a better plan for working families. We don't believe that people should have to work to earn their own poverty and visit food banks. We want to tackle exploitative zero-hours contracts, and we know that Britain only succeeds when people in this city who are working succeed. So we have a better plan for the NHS with more doctors, more nurses, more midwives and more care workers funded by a mansion tax. A better plan for you, ensuring that young people who get the grades get an apprenticeship, young people who are out of work for a year are guaranteed a job and don't end up spending a, a, a lifetime in low-paid, insecure jobs. We're going to cap size, class sizes for five, six and seven-year-olds to make sure that every child gets a good education and we'll cut tuition fees from £9,000 to £6,000 a year. We'll also freeze energy bills until 2017 so they can fall but not rise to help your mums and dads deal with the uh, rising cost of living and we'll raise the minimum wage to £8 an hour, giving working people an £800 a year pay rise. Wakefield deserves better. We think a Labour MP and a Labour government in, in Wakefield and across the country will deliver the change we need. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca Fathry is the Green Party candidate and has ex uh, employment experience in health, education, criminal justice, social welfare. She's been a magistrate in South London since 1997 and currently working as prison nurse. Okay, welcome Rebecca. Thank you. Some would say this is quite an exciting election because it's unlikely that any of the major parties will be able to form a government without the support of the smaller parties. Green Party would not enter into a coalition, but would support on an issue by issue case basis. Others are not so sure about this election. They think all the candidates look the same, the parties don't deliver, and, they, and MPs are not trustworthy. The Green Party wants to be able to reform the parliamentary basis on which we <coughs> deliver goods and services to the country. And at the very heart of this, we put the environment. We would support 100% any government that puts as much thought into its ecological future which is our ecological future, as it does into its finances. There's plenty of money, it's just in the wrong places, is our view. We need to be thinking what's important for the globe. If you think on a very mundane level, that every second breath we take is reliant on oceanic tides that produce mollusks that create oxygen. We are so interdependent on the environment and it's pointless for us to be acting as if we can continue consuming planets beyond our means. We've had the, the news of migrants washed ashore and died yesterday in fleeing from migrate from Libya and it's issues like this that remind us that migration is as a result of war it's a result of unshared resources and inequality one of the things that is uppermost in our minds is the way that austerity has been peddled as the answer we were told in 2010 by David Cameron that we're all in this together and we're patently not. It's, it's uh, stuck in the gullet when MPs enjoyed a 15% pay rise and people <coughs> in, in the armed forces and teachers and nurses were given 1% which is barely in line with um, inflation. The sort of things that are possible um, make 
the Green Party, a visionary party, and it's what attracted a lot of young voters. <coughs> because it doesn't have to be like this. The last reform of, of Parliament was 100 years ago, when women got the vote. And, it's, and our one MP, Caroline Lucas, has called for parliamentary reform, a review to see the way we actually would need to, to have a parliament for the 21st century. We need to ask questions such as, do we want an elected House of Lords? Or perhaps, sorry, do we want a peerage? Or would we like an elected second house instead? Do we want proportional representation as the time come, so we don't find ourselves tactically voting and voting for the least worst option, but having every vote count? Okay, I will leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Anthony Calvert, the Conservative uh, candidate to come forward, please. Uh, Anthony's actually from Wakefield uh, and the constituency means a great deal to it. I spent the last 10 years working in the private sector uh, in small and medium sized businesses. Thank you. And um, so I'm thanking those who have put this event on today. Thank you, Ambia. Thank you, David, for chairing it. Hope you go easy on me. That's why I've just said that. Uh, thank you, Sam, for hosting it. Uh, as I said, uh, David, I'm a local candidate. I was born and brought up uh, in Wakefield. I was educated in Wakefield. I actually came here. I'm not actually here, but I was uh, in Thorns Park for two years. Uh, and I think it's important, uh, and it's one of the most important things that we get back from our surveys that local people tell us, to have a good range of very local candidates. I'm interested in a specific question that is coming a little later on uh, that uh, will refer to that. Um, but I'm the Conservative candidate, uh, which is important to me too. Because when I came here five years ago, I was standing in for a colleague of mine who couldn't make it. I said that the five years uh, between then and now were going to be tough years. And I think it is fair to say that they have been tough years. And after five years of very difficult decision, hard work and patient sacrifice, I think Britain is now on the right track for a brighter, more secure future. It is absolutely vital that we don't go back to square one. Running through our election campaign this year is one central theme. We want to offer working people the security at every stage of their life. And all of this is possible because the Conservative Party have a clear economic plan. It means that we can have a secure and brighter future for you, your family, today and as you get older. You've got to remember at this election that these three important things that our party can offer the people of Britain that no other party can match. Strong leadership. Our manifesto, which was published earlier on, confirms that only the Conservatives really have the leadership necessary to take Britain through to brighter days. A clear economic plan, which is about seeing through that long-term economic plan that we started off uh, five years ago. That is the foundation stone of everything we do. You cannot have strong public services without a strong economy and a brighter, more secure future. Taken together, I think these all add up to what I consider to be a future that is bright for everybody in this country. Whether you're working, whether you're unemployed but need a job, whether you're coming out of school, coming out of college uh, and uh, figuring out what to do with yourself, whether you want to go to university, whether you want to get a, uh, an apprenticeship. Now we think that we need to create a country that we can provide the best start in life for everybody. So here's a few things we're going to do. We're going to increase spending on the National Health Service. We're going to provide a seven day a week access to your GP and deliver a truly seven day National Health Service. We're going to try and work hard to secure your first job. We'll create three million new apprenticeships to go on top of the two and a half million that we have created over these last five years despite difficult times. We're going to continue to raise the tax threshold so you don't pay any tax onto the first £12,500 of income, which means those on minimum wage will uh, effectively have a tax-free income by the end of the Parliament. And as you move out of perhaps your parents' flat or your parents' house and want to try and get your own place, we will do as much as we possibly can to try and provide 2,000 new, uh, 200,000 new starter homes 
at 20% of the market price. It's called uh, Help to Buy. It's been a phenomenal success. We will extend that. We'll extend Right to Buy for those who are in registered social landlord properties so that everybody can have that dream of owning their home. I'm stood here because I think we have the best platform for the future. I'm stood here because I want to be your local member of parliament. I'm stood here hoping that as you go to vote in your first election, that you vote Conservative. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Rebecca grew up in Todmorden, uh, went to the University of Leeds and was the, uh, a Yorkshire member of the European Parliament between 2012 and 2014. Good morning everyone and thank you for coming today. Um, a vote for me and the Liberal Democrats is a vote for policies that create a stronger economy and a fairer society in which there is opportunity for everyone. These policies include a further £400 tax cut for ordinary workers by raising the tax-free allowance to 12500 which is a long-standing Liberal Democrat policy, now being stolen by most of the other parties, but it was ours originally. Um, new strict rules to clamp down on tax evasion and aggressive tax avoidance, including um, failure to prevent economic crimes so dodgy accountants can get sent to prison. And uh, more help for parents by um, extending free childcare, parental leave, um, and free school meals uh, for primary school children. We want to, with a big focus in our manifesto on education, we, want to, we will protect education funding from nursery to college. Um, guarantee qualified teachers, including for early years education. Double the number of businesses taking on apprentices. We've already seen two million more apprenticeships, but you know even more would be great. And also increasing the number of higher level, as in degree equivalent apprenticeships, and making sure that they're seen as a respected alternative to university, because this hasn't been the case in the past. It was vocational education for some reason this country sort of looked down upon, uh, which is which was a bit of a tragedy really. Um, we want to help young people with their first steps in life, so with apprenticeships and also giving a discount card that gives you two-thirds off a bus travel and promising no discrimination of under-25s in the welfare system. We stopped the Tories in government doing this and uh, we still believe we should do that. When it comes to housing, we've got a lot of policies that I think are really helpful for young people, including rent to home, <coughs> where over 30 years your rent payments contribute to eventually um, buying the, ho the house you live in and um, deposit loans for first-time renters under 30. Because often people, you know, you've got your first job, you've got a reasonable salary, but you have trouble raising the deposit to put down on a rented flat. So there'd be a national scheme to, um, to borrow your first deposit. We also want to protect your rights. We believe strongly in civil liberties. There is a Second Freedoms Act, a Digital Bill of Rights, and continuing to oppose the Snoopers Charter. Um, we don't think it actually helps if um, you know the security services can keep all your emails and phone calls. Um, it's not helpful. Um, and we also have a big focus on the environment. We, are, we will implement five green laws to protect the environment and tackle climate change. A Nature Act, a Zero Waste Britain Act, big focus on recycling there obviously. A Green Transport Act, a Zero Carbon Britain and a Green Buildings Act, a big focus on insulating houses to improve uh, fuel, to improve energy efficiency. We also want to keep Britain as an outward facing internationalist nation, cooperating with our European neighbours and further afield, and retain our commitment to 0.7% of GDP going to international development. Um, we're also the only party that's committed to providing the 8 billion additional funding the NHS needs by 2020 according to health service bosses and the only party to have put to have committed to putting mental health on the same footing as physical health and to tackle the stigma around mental health and finally if elected um, it's actually not Wakefield this morning and outward I would listen to local people stand up for their interests and acknowledge all requests of assistance from constituents within a couple of days, because that's really important to people. They've got an MP they can rely on. Thank you. Alan is the UK candidate. Alan's lived in Wakefield since the 80s, uh, moving from Leeds. Uh, Alan's working career has been mainly in the clothing industry, more recently in software systems for car dealerships. Okay, thanks, Alan. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks for inviting me. Um, yeah, I was born in Leeds, um, moved over to Wakefield in 1989, so if you're really kind to me, you'll call me a local right now. 
Um, I got through my working career to a point where I was semi-retired. Didn't want to get into politics at all, um, but decided that people in politics were just not listening to the people in the street. So I felt that I had to do something to try and redress that. So I got into bed, as it were, with UKIP. Why did I do that? I did it because as a businessman, I was seeing that it was a complete waste of money for us to be spending 54 million pounds a day on the EU. And that's one of the cornerstones of the UKIP policy. Doesn't mean to say that UKIP would automatically take us out because it's not our responsibility to do that. It's your responsibility to do that. You need a choice. You need to have your say on whether we stay in the European Union or we come out. I'm, I'm fairly fortunate because I actually voted on staying in the EU, or rather the EEC, the European Economic Community. That's what it was in those days. It was a trading bloc. It wasn't an organisation that, that was trying to foist lots of controls and regulations on us. In the last five years of the government that we just had, there's been 3,600 new legislations drawn up by the EU, not by our government, by the EU. We want to have a look at all of those regulations and repeal them wherever possible. One of the other things that we want to do in UK is to look at how much we're spending on international aid, which is nine billion a year. If that is required for some nations to maintain clean water, sanitation, medication, that's fine. We're, we're quite okay with that. What we're not okay with is giving millions to countries like India that has got an international space program and actually told us that they didn't want any money. But we gave it to them anyway. Now, you've heard of the manifestos that have been released this week. You've heard Labour telling Conservatives that it doesn't add up. You've heard Conservatives telling Labour it doesn't add up. But actually, um, our manifesto was the only one that was validated by the Centre for Economic and Business Research where they looked at it in total and said, it actually does add up. Now we have some cornerstones in our manifesto, as I said, the, um, um, leaving the EU, and of course, our stance on border control and looking at how many people are coming into this country, which is not sustainable. But if you look at our manifesto in full, it covers a full range of items required by a, a, a serious political party, which you can know it. Thank you. Thanks very much for that question, Dylan. Um, we've been clear that no future transfer of powers should take place without um, the, the people of Britain having an in-out referendum. So we will legislate, if we win the next election, for a referendum block if there is any significant treaty change. But we're going to be talking this morning about the many different challenges facing our country. And we don't believe that David Cameron's promise for a, for a referendum over the next couple of years is the biggest issue facing Britain. We believe that the condition of working families, the issues around education, protecting our NHS and our public services are the things that the government should be concentrating on. And it's clear that David Cameron doesn't believe we should be leaving the European Union either. He's doing it more to take control of his own, uh, the right wing of the Conservative Party, putting his party before the interests of the country. So we've seen British the Confederation of British Industry, uh, Nissan, DHL, large companies saying a uh, warning against Britain sleepwalking to an exit from the European Thank Union. You, and I'm clear, it's the biggest peace process the world has seen, and I think we should stay in. Thanks very much. Okay, uh, Rebecca? There are some worrying things happening in Europe. One of the things that uh, um, the Green Party has been fighting against, because we have got lots of Green MEPs, is the Transatlantic Trade Investment <coughs> Partnership. And it's very important that we continue having debates in, in Europe. So it's important, therefore, we stay in, in with the EU. Um, it, a referendum crime will negotiate. That's our, our, our way forward with agreements. We do things democratically. We don't want to bulldoze and, um, and fight for the UK at the expense of uh, a European and global vision. Thank you very much, Anthony. 
Bill, the short answer uh, to that question from the Conservative Party is yes. Yes, we will provide a uh, European Union referendum if we are elected and we form a majority government. Yes, we will do that for a number of reasons. Uh, primarily because a lot of people in Britain want to see it. And if they did want to see it, then they wouldn't have seen, we wouldn't have seen that gradual rise in the Eurosceptic sentiment of Britain. As Alan said in his introduction, it has been about 40 years since we last had an opportunity to say, uh, have our say on our continued membership of the European Union. Now that was a long time before my time, and I feel like an old bugger in this audience, but it's before my time as well. And I think it is right and proper that Britain has that opportunity. Now, of course, um, the Labour Party will give us that referendum, and uh, Mary is a very, very positive supporter, as you would like to think, of the, of the European project. But of course, the European project has morphed massively from what it used to be, which is a trading body of like-minded countries. I think what the Conservative Party finds very, very uh, disappointing is that <coughs> Ed Miliband has refused point blank to allow the people to have their say. Okay. The only, very, 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 the only party that will give you that referendum is the Conservative Party. Any other uh, votes is a wasted vote if you want that referendum. I'm going to say that a little bit, okay. It's about a few seconds left, so I'll give you a little bit. Okay. Like, I'm being kind to you, like you, you did require. <laughs> okay, Rebecca? Uh, the Liberal Democrat policy is very clear on this issue, and it has been for some years, that we will hold an in our referendum when there is a next point of major transfer of power from um, the UK to um, the European Union. We've had this policy for a number of years, it hasn't changed, and it's already, I'm curious that Mary says she wants to legislate for a referendum, because it's already been legislated for by this government. Um, and of course, if there was a referendum, the Liberal Democrats would be campaigning to keep Britain in the European Union because we believe that is the best thing for this country. Thank you very much. Alan? Uh, Dylan, um, as I mentioned when I started speaking, um, I don't think it's very polit any political party to, to say we stay in or we go out. It's up to the people to decide. Um, in a, a recent poll, 77% of the population said that they would want to leave the EU. Now, it was 67%. Uh, which poll? Okay. Um, in um, June of 1975, 67% said that they would want to stay in, and that's why we're still in it. But we would want to give you, the, the people, the responsibility to decide whether we stay in or whether we leave. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for those. Because I don't think it's appropriate. 
Uh, and I believe going forward, members of Parliament need to treat taxpayers' money with absolute respect. Thank you very much. Okay, Rebecca. Um, I think the key point in this is um, transparency in what you do with the expenses and the allowances that you have. Um, as other panel members have said, this is public money and it needs to be you know, treated with appropriate respect. When I was a member of the European Parliament, I published my expenses on my website and I allowed anyone to come into my office and see all the receipts. It's really not very interesting if you do that, by the way. Um, and I had them independently verified because you know this is public money and I needed to show that I was using it in a correct way. And I had a very simple way of, of you know, judging whether I should do something or not because sometimes the rules are not always very clear. I don't, I'm not so familiar with the Westminster rules because I haven't been in Westminster. But can I justify this on the doorstep? In which case, if I can, fine. If not, I don't do it. It's very simple. Thank you very much. Alan? Uh, well, I think it was outrageous what was happening in government. Um, we need to have a right of recall, like Rebecca says, and as far as UKIP is concerned, that means that if 20% of the, if the constituency electorate feel that the MP is doing a bad job, then they can create another vote to see if that um, MP is recalled. Um, we need to also look at what we're actually allowing the MPs. Because even today, there are some that are claiming outrageous amounts, but still staying within the rules. So we need to look at what we're actually allowing them to claim, because it is getting out of hand. Thank you very much, Alan. And finally, Mary? Well, there's no doubt, uh, James, that the expenses scandal was hugely damaging um, to politics. And it's right that where there was criminal behaviour, um, those people were convicted and have served um, their, their time in prison. As a result, Parliament set up the Independent Parliamentary Standards Authority to take the whole issue of MPs' pay and expenses out of being voted at by MPs. <coughs> it's totally wrong that we were voting on our own salaries and conditions. So that is now um, dealt with by an independent body. When people talk about expenses, it's important to know what those expenses are paying for, what they're paying for staff, office furniture, stationery, writing letters, phone bills, all the things that help MPs to do their jobs. And I think it's important that if we want people from lower incomes and to attract people from underrepresented groups into Parliament, that Parliament and, and standing for public office, whether that's locally or nationally, doesn't just become a profession for the rich. So we've said we want full-time MPs doing a full-time job and we will tackle those MPs who are making more money outside Parliament in their second jobs than they are representing the people that elected them to Parliament. Thank you very much. Okay. The key aspect of education is to educate our kids and young people and have them coming out of institutions where they have the skills that they need to progress in life. And I've got to say, as an employer, somebody who uh, has seen very small businesses over the last five years grow and improve, I can tell you that there has been a significant improvement in the quality and ability and aptitude of those coming to the work market. So I think it's important to recognise that teachers do a fantastic job and have done a fantastic job uh, over the last five years. Um, uh, in terms of universities, uh, Universities are amongst the best funded universities now in the world and you are in a very privileged position everybody in this audience who makes the decision to go to university. Uh, I think that we have some universities that uh, really do sort of make the grade throughout the world as being the, the very best. And it's important that we keep these universities funded, we keep these universities uh, churning out the sort of people that I see coming into the private setting, coming out into the workforce today, what's absolutely vital is that we look at what we do and what comes out of universities, what comes out of schools. I think whatever government can do uh, going forward, whether it's the pupil premium when they're going through school, whether it's ensuring that there's rigour in the system, whether they're going through ALS and GCSEs, we've got to ensure that the people that we really look at are the people going, that are going through universities, going through schools, and also of course, that is exactly what parents want to see too. Thank you very much, Rebecca. I understand the concerns about the changes to the A1 system, removing the requirement to do AS levels. Um, cause, and also, I know because my partner has a daughter who's in the first year of A levels right now, um, that AS levels are often quite a good sort of interim step, you know, to see if they want to study that subject longer term, and to give sometimes to give um, children confidence to, to go on. 
Um, so at the moment, we, the Liberal Democrats don't have any plans to further reform the LL system, but I'd certainly be open to hearing um, suggestions on that. Okay, We're generally supportive of the um, A-level reforms, but we want to look in detail at other alternatives, which is the provision of more grammar schools, um, more vocational schools, where people can move towards actual training at an earlier stage. Um, and also going through to university, where we're looking at um, how we can support people who are in STEM courses, where um, our proposal there is that if you go through um, one of the STEM courses in the sciences or medical, then uh, subsequently attend industry for five years, then you don't have to pay. <coughs> you don't have to pay your grant back. That will be paid for you. Okay, thanks very much, Mary. Um, well, there's no doubt that we've seen huge curriculum changes across uh, all ages of the school curriculum. We may talk about that uh, in response to a future question. But we've been very clear <coughs> to keep AS levels and that there would be no changes to the curriculum. There would be a reform curriculum which would come in in September uh, 2017. But we've also been clear, and I was talking to Sam, the principal, about this outside, that we want to introduce a new technical baccalaureate for young people as well. We need to get more scientists, more engineers, out into the, in, into the country and into the world uh, doing the jobs uh, that people need in, in engineering. And so we want um, to have these accredited courses with work placements with employers and new um, institutes of technical education set up to deliver that technical baccalaureate. Thank you very much. Rebecca? Uh, to answer your question, Sue, uh, the AS levels we wouldn't necessarily touch, but if you, if you think of the, th the education around, we want to be empowering young people to have much more choice, vocational and non-vocational. We see the education as, a, a, play, as a, a means of critical inquiry that should develop throughout your life. So we'd be ha happier seeing as much respect paid to arts and humanities as to the sciences, and we want to not saddle young people with a huge debt for the rest of, of, their, of their working lives. We want to see um, an education maintenance grant um, brought in, in again for 16 to 17 year olds and scrapping of tuition fees. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Doing this, I was um, president of the Youth Inter Group in the European Parliament, and we, I worked with schools, colleges, and many, many youth organisations. Um, got the badge of one of my campaigns. I pay my intern. What about you? Um, didn't make myself popular with some colleagues on that one, but I quite frankly feel so strongly about it. I didn't care. Um, I have experience as a student. I'm just young enough to have got student loans when I went to university and I remember what it was like struggling on a, a low salary when I, um, when I first uh, started working. I also got made redundant uh, three months after I bought my first flat. That wasn't very nice but I managed to get over it. Um, and I've, I've got experience of balancing part-time work with studies because I did a master's degree and I couldn't afford to not work for a year so um, I worked four days a week and on my day off I went to university from nine to five. Um, so I, I speak to youth groups a lot, and I did all the time I was an MEP, so I know what, interest, what interests and what concerns young people have. And um, I do my best to encourage more young people to be active in politics, not only political, politically, but in their communities. And the more encouragement you give, the better. Okay, thanks very much. Hello? Um, not got a lot of experience of representing young people other than my two children and my five grandchildren and I've represented them pretty well throughout their lives. Um, I also had about 40 young people, well a lot younger than me anyway, as programmers in my company and uh, we were very good at mentoring them and um, providing them with a good life. Um, I think that the main way that any politician can represent young people is if young people get involved you need to get involved with your representatives. And that starts from voting. I was quite appalled this week. I was out meeting people, and the number of young people that I met who said, no, I'm not bothered, not bothering to vote. And I thought that was just awful. You know, because you can't even say anything is wrong in society if you've abdicated your responsibilities to vote. So it's a two-way street. 
Thanks, Alan. Okay, and Mary. Thanks, David. Well, I've worked for four years in a youth organisation in Brussels, and I ran the first pan-European campaign with MTV to get young people to vote, um, which was uh, a, a big success um, in the early 1990s. But what I've always tried to do as, as the MP for Wakefield is to work with young people from the city <coughs> who are interested in politics and they want to get on. So, for example, Ben Whisker, who's um, a, a lad who lives in Thorns, um, was my youngest volunteer at 10, uh, 10 years ago. He's now doing a degree at Oxford University and applying for a master's at York University. Jack Hemingway, who's sitting there um, as a counsellor um, for Hallbury, um, came on work placement from Huddersfield University and um, he never really left my office actually after that. So um, there's, I, I always try and help and mentor young people, particularly from this city, uh, who are interested in politics because I think if you don't use your vote, you, don't, you lose your voice. And as a party, we've said that we will reduce the voting age to 16 because we think if you can join the army, get married, and pay your taxes when you're 16, you should also have that democratic right. Thanks, Mary. Uh, finally, Rebecca. Just taking up Mary's final point there about voting, we also would uh, reduce the voting age to 16. The, um, um, I want to answer this personally, really, and just take up uh, uh, Alan's point there. Um, the, um, the, the way to, to get people voting is to engage people right from the outset and one of the ways is to get people into uh, work, be it, get into their work mentality. Um, I was um, in a youth offending team as a, um, as a police officer and then as a nurse and as a school nurse. So the sorts of experience that I would bring would be around um, speed mentoring which is about looking at ways to use older people's work experience with younger people. Um, the, um, the speed mentoring happens in a venue such as this and you, you rotate and find out what sort of things you might want to relate to and how people got into their jobs in the first place. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing you said. 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 We'll just have a break from it. I noticed my two people needed a, a drink of water, so if you want to take a break. Are you okay? You took few people. Okay, uh, we've got Brandon, who's right at the back now. Anthony, did I forget you? Don't forget me. Uh, sorry, Brandon. Carry on. <laughs> sorry, Anthony. Okay, no, it's quite right. It's quite right. Um, yeah. This is my campaign team. I'm very used to that. Look, my campaign team was actually an extremely young campaign team. Um, I, um, I think the average age of my campaign is about 23, which is quite extraordinary when, um, uh, of the campaigns I've certainly been involved in in the past. I think it's important that you just don't, let's not, let's not patronise um, anybody in this, in this room. Young people are, are, are people uh, as important to me as, and as important as the, the, the government, or should be anyway, as anybody else in society. You've got to really stand on your record, you've got to stand on your pledges. I think this has been a government that's tried to get uh, more uh, people uh, with the opportunity to have their first home. I mentioned earlier on uh, a help to buy and we're wanting to extend that uh, into the next parliament. Uh, young people want security that they know when they start a family that, they, that, that the government is on their side and uh, we're proposing an additional 15 hours a week of free childcare for uh, three to four year olds, bring it to 30 hours. Uh, so I think you can try to differentiate between different segments of society. I don't really think that's important. I think everybody in this audience is as important as every other section of society. And it's what you do, it's how you, uh, it's how you propose policy that I think is the thing that we, we need to focus on. Um, and it's only going to get worse, a lot worse. According to Ofsted, over the next 10 years, we'll need another 900,000 school places. So to educate another 900,000 people in the system, we're going to need a lot more teachers. And that's one of the reasons why we're looking at the STEM courses, so that people who are going in, coming out of university um, into the teaching profession, as long as they go into that profession for five years, then they don't have to pay back any student loans. 
And that's our commitment to them to make sure that we're getting the right people on the right courses to satisfy the need as it goes further forward. Um, in terms of um, uh, the inspection regimes, uh, we do believe that that is required. We need to have a level of excellence within our education system, but it does need to be reviewed regularly to make sure that, that there is a quality of care within those inspection regimes. Thank you very much, Anne. Okay, Mary? Well, David Cameron has changed the law allowing unqualified teachers into the classroom, Brandon, and that is threatening school standards here in Wakefield. We've also seen a crisis in school places. We've got um, about 900 infants, five, six and seven year olds, now being taught in Wakefield in classes of more than 30. And those of you who have younger brothers and sisters today, it's a big day when um, your mums and dads will find out about whether your brother or sister has got a school place. Um, and we know that we, we've said we will cap class sizes for infants by scrapping the Tories' failing free school policies. And we also know that life is getting harder for young people with um, the rise in tuition fees and a fall in the number of apprenticeships for young people. So we'll make the investment in education to make sure that every child has a good edu education, that we have a properly qualified teacher in every classroom, we have ways of keeping teachers in the teaching profession rather than them um, going into the management sizes and we'll put teaching standards first and make sure that we have a 21st century system raising standards in every part of the country. Okay, thank you very much. Rebecca? I started off as an infant teacher and I look, uh, see my colleagues now really struggling, um, as you say, Brendan, with the morale in schools. I think not largely that's due to all the testing, that they worry about the Ofsted's inspections, the kids were about SATs, and the Green Party would scrap that. It's important that there are some standards, but there's no reason why it can't be standards upheld by the local authority or within it, uh, Her Majesty's inspectors, and even students participating to give feedback on, on, on the education they receive. So I think that's a better way forward for education in terms of testing. Um, I'm also very worried about the increasing privatisation in, in the school system. So the Greens would want to bring grammar schools and comprehensives to, together under local authority. Um, we want academies to um, have be answerable to local authorities in the way that they're not at present. Thank you very much. Uh, well, Brandon, um, you're very fortunate to go to a school that's one of the best in the district has improved massively over the last five years. Uh, as have most schools across the country. Uh, you know, it's a statistical fact now that there's over a million uh, more pupils being taught in good or outstanding schools since 2010. And if, you, if I'm honest, you know, the Labour Party, Mary talks again, the Labour Party really did let people down. One in three pupils leaving primary school in 2010 were <laughs> unable to read, write or add up uh, to, uh, to the standards that we set ourselves and that internationally are set for us. But to 2000, uh, to 2000 2009, uh, the, uh, the, the quality of and calibre of people coming out of school uh, able to read properly went down from, we were seventh in the world in 2000, we, down, we went down to 25th when we took over, the Conservative Party took over, from 8th to 25th in math, uh, 28th should I say in maths, 4th to 16th in science, and those are our internationally recognised tables. So you've got to improve school standards, you've got to improve the standards of, uh, of teaching going forward. And our teachers, and I'm going to come back to it again, a fantastic job. And Mary mentioned that qualified teachers in preschools, they're phenomenally popular wherever they go. And they're set up by pupils and teachers, and they're very, very, very in a vast majority of the case anyway, very much oversubscribed. It's a working policy. Thanks, Thank you. Okay. Manifesto does put a big focus on education, as I mentioned um, in my speech, protecting education funding, um, requiring um, all children to be taught by qualified teachers. And we would also establish a Royal College of Teaching to, um, to oversee uh, training and development in the profession, as already exists for other professions like the Royal College of you know, Physicians. Um, and we would want to continue with Teach First, which is a programme bringing um, you know, high caliber graduates into the teaching profession, we want to continue to support that. Um, and we want a requirement for, um, 
for every primary school to have a science teacher, one qualified um, in science, and for all um, secondary school teachers who teach a subject to have a degree um, in that area. In terms of inspection, we'd want that extended to academy chains. We think they should be subject to exactly the same inspection requirements as um, local authority schools. Okay, thank you very much indeed for that question. What is your highest policies on tuition fees? There's a real crisis for students in terms of the cost of living while studying, and some will never pay off their loans. Should there be more investments in grants and bursaries? Thanks, Jasmine. First of all, congratulations on, on your election, and um, I think young people today are much more interested and involved in politics, certainly, than they were um, when I was leaving school. So thank you uh, for the work that you're doing for the city in that, and I hope you go down to lunch and you have a great day in Parliament as well. Um, first of all, the Tories and Lib Dems broke um, their promise on tuition fees to young people, and I think that's been a huge erosion in trust that the young people have in politicians. Um, but you also talked about the cost of living for young people, and I think um, I've certainly been contacted in my office by particularly mature students who are really struggling with balancing family life and, and the cost of keeping a home running and the fact that they've really found it impossible to make ends meet. Um, so we have said that we would tackle exploitative zero hours contracts. We want to raise the minimum wage so that we can make work pay so those people who are combining studying with working maybe a part-time job to help fund their studies um, get uh, more more money in and we've also said that we would cap rent rises and we would uh, abolish letting fees so as if, if you end up going to university one of the first things you'll find is that your rents can go up very unpredictably and you can be charged uh, letting fees as a, as a tenant um, they, these are things that in my day were only charged to the landlords. So we don't want young people or older students giving up their courses. And we also need to make sure, I just want to go back on one, one final thing just on what Anthony said about Hulbury School. That school was rebuilt under a Labour government, as was South Parade uh, in South Osset. I haven't seen too many um, schools rebuilt under this Tory yet down government. I'd like to say that so, this, the uh, um, Student grants that we would in, that we would implement and abandon tuition fees is not a pie in the sky option. <coughs> There's been no question really about e economy per se. So I'd just like to emphasise that we have 70 billion pounds in this country in tax evasions, and that that money alone is something that only 300 MR, MHMRC <coughs> people are are employed to look into, whereas we have a meagre 1.2 billion in benefit fraud where 3,000 Department of Work and Pension staff um, investigate. So there is money to, to do away with tuition fees and have a, a flourishing student grant. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, don't think in all honesty, that Mary wants to get onto the argument about PFIs because that's how um, uh, Holbury School was rebuilt. So if she does, then if she does, then uh, we can talk about that all all day. But to answer your question directly, uh, our universities, as I mentioned earlier on, have, have some of the best uh, universities in the world. Uh, when you go to university, you will be getting a degree that is recognised across the world. We have excellent choice in courses. We have excellent choice in universities as well, uh, and that's because they've been properly funded. Universities need to be properly funded. I remember when I went to university, I was, I think, the same year as Rebecca. I was, I experienced the first year of, of having to have loans instead of grants. And it's a very difficult adjustment. My, my experience was as soon as I started earning up 14 grand, I had to start paying it back immediately. And it was, it, it wasn't phased in, it was a, it was an incredibly difficult uh, uh, financial management project, as we say. Uh, what we have brought through in a tough decision, in a tough economic climate, that's not forget that tough economic climate, we, we change the rules where as people don't have to start paying off student debts until they hit £24,000 a year and then it's incremental. So the idea is it's hopefully not going to bankrupt you as it probably did Rebecca and I. Uh, and I think that's important to, uh, to mention. Uh, there's, uh, there's an important choice made in this election whether we continue to uh, fund our schools through, and uh, sorry, our universities through those who use it although they go back to funding it through general taxation. And I don't think that uh, it is appropriate for those who are going into 
uh, work for the following 1620 in education, of those indeed who are uh, wanting to go into apprenticeships, uh, that those should pay the fees, uh, um, indeed pay the, the contributions towards universities if they're not using them. Hi Yasmin, um, I've met a number of members of the Youth Parliament, so I hope you very much enjoyed your time there. Um, I think there is, you, you, your question hit on the, the key problem here is, it's not tuition fees that stop people going to university, uh, because it's basically free at the point of use, you pay back only when you earn um, 21,000 and then it goes up. And if you never earned a decent amount of money, you don't pay back anything, or you pay back a, a much smaller amount. Um, I think the, the, you hit the point there that the crisis is more in terms of um, living costs uh, and I'd certainly be um, interested in seeing uh, possibilities for the you know, increased bursaries. And this happens actually, um, the Labour plan to cut tuition fees to 6,000 is, is a bit of a con because it only affects students who, when graduating, earn more than 35,000. So, and the universities themselves are very concerned about this because they're worried it will stop their ability to give bursaries to poorer students. Um, so that's where the funding should be targeted and universities do that now and I certainly encourage that to continue. And also so the Liberal Democrats have also committed ourselves to an independent review of um, higher education funding. Hey Yasmin. Um, there's money around as Rebecca said. Um, in actual fact, because we're in the EU, we have to provide 30 countries with loans for their students coming into the UK. But the reality of that is that we only manage to collect about 11% of it. That's 11% are actually paying back their loans when they're coming from other EU countries. So that money could be used if we charged people from other EU countries to lower the cost for our students in the UK. The problem has been cherry picking parts of the of the emergency services that could, that are fruitful for private private companies to take take away. So you've got um, people falling between the gaps, as it were, in in uh, not being able to access the services that they need. The emergency services, as I see it, are so so crucial that we need to be keeping the morale as looking back to the question on teachers' morale, the morale in, in all public services is at such a low ebb and we've got a lot of cuts to come. So I, I would see that as being potentially dangerous for all our, our services. Thanks. Um, I sometimes think listening uh, to the Greens, and we've had again, a debate earlier in the week actually, or I think it was earlier in the week, um, I always sometimes think listening to Greece that there's a magic money fairy that's going to come flying around and just deposit lots and lots of money here, there and everywhere. Well, uh, Fred, you, you can't just keep on throwing money uh, at, at everything and hoping that the problem goes away. And sadly, that's actually what happened down in, uh, here in, in Wakefield. We've got our own experience with the Labour magic money fairy coming in and sprinkling £14 million on a joint uh, fire and ambulance at headquarters down by the Paragon Business Park. And if you know it, it's near where I could know where my parents live actually. And that, uh, that's, that's been unused, that's completely gone to waste. And so what's necessary is, to, is for us to recognise that you're only going to get strong public services, you're only going to get a strong national health service, you're going to get strong education, everything to do with public services, full <coughs> stop, that you as taxpayers are going to be contributing on if you can have a strong economy. And you're only going to get a strong economy if you continue with this long-term economic plan that Conservatives are pursuing. Um, in terms of the emergency services, the plans that we have in our manifesto include um, increasing um, the number of uh, black and ethnic minority uh, police officers being recruited because we don't think that the police force sufficiently reflects the population they have to take care of. Um, and although it's not in the manifesto, um, I did campaign on this quite a lot as an MEP, which is to um, get a VAT exemption for um, Mountain and Moorland, more relevant Moorland rounds here. Um, rescue services, I think it's quite important. We're almost there on that one. Um, Tommy took my thunder as far as the communication centre was concerned. 14 million of local money just wasted. The place is mothballed, they can't get rid of it. Um, and the reason for that is that people were not asked what was required. 
Um, I have some colleagues in UKIP with, within the fire service and they said that they had said it is not required. And that's why it's never been used. As far as um, our manifesto is concerned, we're saying that there should be um, a review to combine authorities wherever possible to reduce back office services and put more money onto frontline policing um, and frontline firefighting where required. Thanks, Yasmin. Well, first of all, I, I just want to make a point about um, the National Health Service. I mean, I, I want to take you back in, in a little history lesson for those of you doing history. When we set it up um, after the Second World War, the Tories voted against it. And I think the last five years have shown once more why they cannot be trusted with the National Health Service. They cut um, 7,000 nurse training places. So now, when Pinterfields Hospital needs um, to hire uh, the 220 more nurses, they're sending people over to Spain uh, to recruit 30 uh, nurses there and over to India where they've just recruited another 80 uh, nurses. We're seeing a crisis in accident and emergency um, with uh, over a million people waiting uh, more than four hours in accident and emergency over the last year and we're also seeing one in four people waiting more than a week just to get in to see their GPs. Labour's got a better plan for the National Health Service. We will tax properties over £2 million and use that money to hire 8,000 more doctors, 20,000 more nurses, 3,000 more midwives and 5,000 more home carers to make sure that our, uh, the older patients are able to leave hospital and get the care that they need in their own home. But what we won't do is make unfunded spending commitments, as Anthony's party has done. They're uh, un totally unfunded, £8 billion pounds for the NHS. Um, they cannot say where that, that money is coming from, and I think they are the party that is suffering the magic money dis tree disease. Okay, Over the last parliament, we have seen a significant growth in smaller parties, such as the Green Party in UK. Given this is the case and the idea of co coalition becoming ever more prominent, should we be holding a referendum on a new democratic and in inclusive electoral voting system in the near future? My name? Me first? Yeah, um, uh, well, the answer to the track to that is that we had a referendum in 2011. Uh, on the alternative vote system, uh, which was quite roundly rejected uh, by the public. Uh, I believe that that has probably answered the question, answered your question, uh, for uh, another couple of elections. But of course, that's the nature of democracy. If we have, if we have parliamentarians, if we have, uh, if we have uh, people who are wanting to see a, a change in the electoral system, then it probably has to be um, revisited. <coughs> We are going to be gooding, as you'd expect me to say, we're going to be gooding 100% uh, for a, a majority Conservative government. I think that the first past the post system in this country is uh, it's very simple to understand, it's very simple to administer, and it uh, leads to strong governments. Uh, I think that the, even the coalition over the last, uh, the last five years, where two parties came together in the national interest to try and save this country from the atrocious mess that we inherited, I think that that has been a, 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 on the core issue of keeping the economy stable and keeping people, getting people into new jobs. I think it has worked very well. It's, we frayed by the edge, around the edges. Myself and Rebecca get on very well, but I think one or two people in the cabinet probably didn't over the last five years. But I think, broadly speaking, what's happened so far with first past the post is good. Um, it's no surprise to hear a Tory defended first past the post. I have to say. Um, turkeys don't vote for Christmas, I believe is the expression. Um, I think that um, it's very clear that the first past the system is just, it's past its sell by date. It works when you had in the 1950s, you know, 90% of people voting either Labour or Tory. What it's going to, we're not going to get majoritarian government through first past the which is a big sort of, you know, bonus that people say, oh, but it returns stable majoritarian government. No, it doesn't, and it's not going to do for, in, I can't see it happening in the foreseeable future. Obviously, the Democrats are committed to electoral reform. We would introduce single transferable vote. Um, Anthony obviously believes it's too complicated for British people. The Irish have been doing it since 1921. Um, I don't think we're any inherently less intelligent than Irish people. Um, <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> um, and I think you know we have to recognise the political reality we're in. It's not a two-party system. 
We're in a multi-party system like most European democracies, and we need to change the voting system to adapt to that. I don't see a change coming soon. It would certainly be in our interest at UKIP for that change. If you look at the polls recently, we're polling about 15%, and that seems to translate into two, um, two, M two MPs as far as the um, uh, media is concerned. Well, I hope it's more than two, but that's what they're saying we're going to get. If you look at, it, at the results in proportional representation, you only need to look back exactly one year ago when we um, elected our MEPs. And because that's proportional representation, we ended up with three UKIP MEPs in Yorkshire. So it would be a vast change for us if that were the case, but I don't see it happening anytime soon, especially, especially because we had the referendum fairly recently. Right? Um, thanks, um, Liam. Well, we had this referendum on, exactly on this issue in 2011, and I don't believe that referenda should be rerun just because we didn't get some people didn't get the answer that they wanted, whether it's on this or any other issue. I would say that the last five years' experience of coalition government has given people every reason to vote for an outright Labour majority government next time round. And I would say whether it's um, the Tories' broken promise on balancing the books by 2015, um, we've seen them borrow over £200 billion more than they promised, um, and we've got stagnant wages and too many low paid jobs which are also leading to rising borrowing as they failed to cut the welfare bill. Well the Greens do see that the, the that, uh, proportional representation works very well in the EU. We seem to have mastered it with voting for MEPs. And the problem is that people feel disenfranchised from um, participating in government processes at all, if they're always calculating who, well, I like the horse race, who's going to be the winner and how can I, how can I tactically change that. Um, to make every vote count, I think we really do need to see de decentralised uh, power from government and that's one of the reforms in a whole package of things that um, we need to review. Um, in terms of the, of, um, uh, the fact that uh, the first past the post system doesn't represent the, a majority of people voting in the sense that we've, we've got such a uh, low turnout at, um, at polling booths that anything that engages people to actually vote, to participate, is going to be a step forward in democracy. We've got in four days time is the deadline for voter registration and it will be pitiful um, the, the in my terms, the, the, the amount of people that will turn out to vote. Um, if you view this as a more exciting election, perhaps it would be slightly higher. But it saddens me that ethnic minorities are, total, are, are, are much poorer in terms of uh, the voting, uh, voting numbers than uh, people in this room today. Thank you very much, Liam. Thanks very much indeed. Uh, thanks very much indeed for the panel. That was a great debate. Uh, thanks for keeping to the minutes. It is quite hard sometimes to school these things. Uh, if we can give the panel a, a round of applause, please. <laughs>